So there are two things you need to know about me. First is I'm from Brooklyn. This means that I love cities. I love everything about them. I love the urban ballet, and I'm interested in how and why cities change. Second, I'm a single mother of five-year-old twins, which means that my interest is in cities is now focused on how we can make them better places for my children and everyone else. So this interest led me to become a geographer who has researched gentrification and the way that it affects urban neighborhoods. And in over a dozen years of teaching and research on gentrification, the thing that bothers me most is when people refer to gentrification as inevitable, part of the natural evolution of urban neighborhoods. What I mean when I say gentrification is the development of high-end uses in previously working class neighborhoods of the city, resulting in the displacement of working class people, businesses, and land uses. Displacement is central to the experience of gentrification. Some refer to it as social cleansing. There has to be a better way to accomplish urban development than to displace the very people who are building the neighborhoods we now deem desirable. This gentrification can take many forms. It's the upscale cupcake cafe. It's the coffee shop with the $4 coffee that replaced the mom and pop store. It's rental apartments being converted to condos. Um, industrial lofts being turned into luxury apartments, defunding public schools in order to open new charter schools, even the Google bus, right? All of these are visions of the way in which upper class uses and upper class people are taking over previously working class neighborhoods of the city. So again, this underprivileges, this actively displaces neighborhoods that, that were functioning neighborhoods that were doing well. Do you want to live in the ghetto? This is the question asked of my friend Vicki when she says she disagrees with the pro-gentrification policies of her aldermen. Of course, no one wants to live in a ghetto, a segregated, disinvest disinvested place, often with high crime and low quality housing, schools, and access to city services. The question is indicative of a false choice in a lot of urban development talk, that the only choices are ghettos or gentrification. These are two sides of the same coin. Ghettos, just like gentrified neighborhoods, are the result of active policy and development decisions. Neither one of them is inevitable. Vicki lives in Pilsen, a Mexican-American neighborhood here in Chicago. And while Pilsen has had its problems, Vicki has never experienced it as a ghetto. It's a neighborhood with an incredibly vital street life and a long tradition of community organizing. I joke that Vicki is the mayor of Pilsen because it's impossible to walk down the street with her without every single person we meet saying hello and catching up with her. This is, we don't do this in Brooklyn where I'm from. <clears throat> so Vicki, and one of the things that Vicki complains about the influx of gentrifiers now being experienced in Pilsen is that they don't say hello on the street. And this is ind indicative of the fact that they're not engaged with the larger neighborhood. Vicki models what I would like to argue for here today, which is the building of more careful cities, cities full of care, which lead us to build urban neighborhoods that are adequately resourced and that pay attention to social justice as good urban form. Right? That's what we should be going for, rather than this, this competition over space. So Vicki models what I would like all of us to do, someone who gets involved and makes her place home, right? a better home for everybody. <clears throat> this, kind of, this kind of politics of care, um, I come to by virtue of mothering. So again, as a single mother of twins, I am all too aware of the fact that cities are not set up for care work and make it very difficult to balance care with other demands. Right? And so when I comment on this, the way in which care has been seen as, as something that is an individual responsibility rather than a collective good, I'm often told that if I don't like it, I shouldn't have had children. Well, this kind of individualistic ideology positions success or failure of both individuals and entire neighborhoods as the result of personal choices and individual responsibility. But of course, individual choices are made within specific contexts. These contexts are geographic, raced, class, gendered, aged, and abled. No one is an island. Instead, an ethic of care allows us a different way of being in the world, relating to people as if they matter with attentiveness and compassion. That's from Beverly Skaggs, by the way. <clears throat> so this is particularly important when we're talking about the dominant discourse around gentrification, which is that gentrification improves neighborhoods that have been run down by crime and gangs and drugs and people who simply don't care about where they live. This story profoundly lacks compassion 
as does the displacement that gentrification brings. Urban gentrifiers are often um, spoken about as though they are pioneers, settling the urban frontier. This story ignores the people who are there already, people like Vicky, who have suffered through decades of disinvestment, through redlining, blockbusting, deindustrialization, budget cuts, and outright neglect. Right? So an ethic of care, the care that, like Vicky, has shown her neighborhood and others like her, creates better neighborhoods and in the process of improving their neighborhoods, showing care to their neighborhoods, accomplishing benefits like better schools and better access to public transportation and more green space, they actually enact their own displacement. Right? The care work that working class neighbors have shown to their neighborhoods is then what makes it attractive to gentrification. So we need to rethink care. We need to look at care of people and place as, and measure it through outcomes for all people not just higher property values in some places. Right? When property values become more important than people, there's something seriously wrong. We need instead to see our self-interest in the things that we share. I found an example of this kind of politics of care in some place I didn't expect to find it, the school where my twins are now in kindergarten. It's a school with a fairly diverse racial and class profile and has been improving consistently over the past few years. And this improvement has led parents at the school to be concerned about how gentrification will affect the school. And if the school will lose its distinctive identity, that's very much related to the fact that it is a diverse school. When a new principal was hired relatively recently, uh, one of the common questions at community meetings was how the candidate would deal with gentrification. So this has been a, a concern across race and class in the school. And there is an activist group of parents who is intent on not just organizing to make sure that this school is adequately resourced, but their activism has extended beyond just the school that their children are in to other public schools in the neighborhood and activism with other, with other groups. And this care is visible. You can see it when you walk in the school. It feels like a protective bubble amidst all the turmoil surrounding uh, public education in Chicago these days. Right? So that, that care works, and that care is becoming citywide and they are making connections with, for example, the Chicago Teachers Union. And think about how a collective community of care between teachers, students, and parents would enable us to change the conversation around education from just how to get your kids into one of the few good schools to a systematic look at the lack of care we have shown our children in allowing the system to exist as it is. Right? This kind of community of care allows us to, mu to move beyond the us versus them narrative that isolates certain underserved groups in a way that is strategic to achieving their displacement. We need to form alliances that recognize common values across people and shared oppressions between people, rather than things like race or class that may seem more obvious. And if we can form these alliances, that is one way to contest gentrification as inevitable, as the only path to urban revitalization. Collective care is collective responsibility. Cities are the way we make them, and everyone has a role to play. So get out there and care. Join a community organization. Support your local public school. Get to know your neighbors. Form your own communities of care. We're in this together. Thank you.